I'm really excited for this session. Um, it's going to be two speakers. Our first speaker is going to be Matt Ringel, who is at Ohio State University. And a, as he's talked, his topic, translational research, and sort of discuss the way to combine sort of your clinical care, what you learn from your patients, also into a lab, and what you're learning from your research, and bringing those two things together. And um, following that, um, Charles Emerson will be here as well, and he's going. He is the current, uh, the editor in chief of Thyroid, and is going to discuss sort of how to get your work published, the steps in writing up your research or writing up reports, and and what's really looked for when you're submitting it to a journal. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm going to get this thing hooked up here, so watch your ears. Okay, so I know there are, there are a couple. I'm doing this as a low tech thing, um, on purpose. Uh, I, I, having been in your shoes uh, now a long time ago, I used to think it was horrible to just sit there and watch everyone's slides go on and on and on, and I'd just be falling asleep. So we're going to try to have this not be that way. Um, there are a couple folks in the room who know me. Um, so I'll give you a little bit about my history and what I do. And then what I think would be best is let's try to generate maybe three or four things that are on your guys' minds regarding futures, potential futures in academic medicine focused on translational research. Um, and then let's make sure we can try to get those covered in about 45 minutes to an hour. Sound good? So that's going to require you to speak up. Not something that everyone likes to do. And we probably got a group of you who are hungover from last night, having watched the group of people dancing last night till about 11. Um, OK, so first thing about me, I'm, I'm a professor at Ohio State. Um, I did my. Uh, fellowship at Johns Hopkins, uh, where I uh, spent uh, a year as a clinical fellow and two to three years in, in the lab, um, and then moved to D.C. to the Washington Hospital Center with Len Wartofsky and Ken Berman, where I started seeing a fair number of patients, but also started my own lab there, and uh, was able to get independently funded while there, and then eight years ago was recruited to Ohio State to co-direct our thyroid cancer unit. Um, and to bring our translational group together uh, as, they pr as a primary person who has one foot in the clinic and one foot in the lab. And a couple of people can verify that that's true in, in the back. Um, uh, our situation is a little special at Ohio State because we've got our, in our thyroid cancer unit about 10 to 15 uh, principal investigators focused on thyroid cancer or thyroid disease. Uh, we currently have NCIs only program project grant uh, for thyroid cancer. Uh, and then my lab directly has ranging anywhere between five and nine or 10 people, depending on who's coming in and coming out, um, and the level of funding that's going on at, at the time. Uh, but one key component of our program is that it's really a bedside to bench program. Notice I don't describe it as a bench to bedside program. And I think I can speak for myself, but also for Larry Kirshner, we've got a, uh, Sissy Jang, we've got a couple of their lab members here, where much of the research is driven by a clinical problem, and then say, okay, how are we going to look at this so that we can improve health, their, the patient's health? So I think it's one of the coolest things in the world to see a patient, get their tissue, study their tissue in the lab, make a cell line out of it, or go to the clinic and do ultrasounds in patients, and then go to the lab and do ultrasounds in mice all on the same day. I think that, that's a lot of fun, uh, and I think that's what new discovery is all about. So what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit is how I evolved into the thyroid cancer area, and then what I think are some challenges to the field, but also some really nice things now that they didn't used to have too, because I'm sure many of you have heard, oh, funding is so difficult now. Since 2008, it's really difficult. You know, you want to see how you're going to do, but there are some really great programs for young investigators that are unique to young investigators uh, that you can take advantage of and do well initially to get the, to get the right things done so that you can then have an independent career. So um, when I came out of fellowship, I worked in thyroid cancer. My primary project as a fellow, we published, but it was a negative study. Uh, I, we got it funded. Uh, I worked on mutations in GQ and G11 in thyroid cancer, looking at PKC signaling, and we found no mutations. So we published that as a negative study. On the side, uh, I had a second idea that I floated by my clinical mentor and my lab mentor, and we all worked on it together. I actually don't know that it was my idea. It probably was more my mentor's idea. 
Uh, and I did this second project, which was a molecular detection system, as a side project. That project did well, okay, which was not my primary project. Um, and that was able to get some funding to then move me on toward a faculty position with a lab. Um, when I left my fellowship and went to my first job, I was seeing patients three days a week. I was also on consult service three months a year. Uh, I did about a month of internal medicine service. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it wasn't my favorite. Um, and also got the lab going. And you do that when you've got a really good support system around you in terms of mentorship within your division or department that you're in. So, so fit is extremely important, and mentorship clearly doesn't end when you're done with fellowship. Uh, when you start your academic career, you need to transition to a place where you've got some people that you trust and that are going to support you. That's really essential in the field. Um, what um, NIH has now for people who are interested in clinical or translational careers um, uh, is a loan repayment program to try to get people to consider going into this. And I hope everyone here knows it. Does everyone know about this program? This did not exist until about I don't know, five to eight, maybe ten years ago. Um, and what this is, is this is a way that you have to write a grant, a scientific grant with a mentor. It's a mentored award, but they will pay back a percentage of your educational loans to try to make that not be a disincentive to go into academics for a career, recognizing that you could go into practice and be making more than you would in research and that the financial scale, while it may eventually catch up over time, is a little bit different and you might have kids or spouses and other things in your life that you want to move forward with. So this is a really good program. They fund a fairly high percentage. I don't know what it is now. Do you, anyone know? What's that? Yeah, it's up to 35000 a year and then I think the funding percentile is actually pretty high in comparison to other grants and, and I think this is a really great program. Um, the other thing is that societies like the ATA, the Endocrine Society, the American Cancer Society, um, uh, many other societies, the diabetes societies if you're doing autoimmunity, um, all have special programs for young investigators. And they are typically limited to, um, uh, to people who are less than six or seven years out, depending on the program, of their last training. So those, again, those funding percentages are higher than initial solo public uh, things, um, but they still require good mentorship. So again, it's a theme I'm going to come back to, is that no one, you'll see no one winning an award here who doesn't, on their first, second, third, and fourth slides, thank a half a dozen people who have been mentors for them. So what, when I was running our fellowship program, which I ran for about five years, and I would sit down with our fellows, I would tell them that it was less important to me as their fellowship director what area then they would go into. It was more important to me how their fit was with the mentor because they're going to get a good research experience and propel them in a good direction if they like who that is. Okay? So those are just a few words about this. I, I, you know, I think the other thing that people are very concerned about is funding. Um, and my, uh, for you guys, I think it's, it's hard to predict where things are going to be for independent R01 grants in five years. You know, I think the funding rates may go up, they may go down, the number of people applying may go up, they may go down. Uh, so that's hard to, that's, that's a hard thing to predict. I would say that an important thing is from an institutional standpoint or from an environment standpoint is if you have a specific area you're interested in, then try to go to a place or try to get to a place that has some resources for your area of interest. And that doesn't have to be within the endocrine division. It could be within oncology. It could be within rheumatology. It could be within surgery. It doesn't matter, really, as long as you have that cocoon of mentorship and support for what you want to do. Okay? So in the room, who's a basic science person? I know you guys are. And Samantha's not here. She's probably practicing her talk a hundred times. Um, and clinical fellows, the rest of the room. And who is um, in the, who's a first year fellow? Any first year fellows? So a couple of you. Second or third year fellows? 
So the second and third year fellows, are you doing mostly research at this point or clinical? And who's in the lab? So a couple of you. And who is doing clinical research? About a little, a few more that way. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty good mix of, of the group. Um, and, and I think those same opportunities are available for basic as well as clinical research. Um, one thing to, to know is that I think many med medical schools have recognized that translational and clinical research takes a long time, a little longer than their traditional tenure track because you're oftentimes doing clinical trials and dealing with IRBs, which we all know can take an extra year or two more than you think. Uh, or nowadays dealing with the IACUCs with all their different requirements for mice that have changed dramatically over the past five years. So many institutions are recognizing this and extending the timeline for promotion. So another thing to think about is that if you're going to do an academic career, some places have a six or seven year timeline to, be, to get promoted to associate professor if you're on the tenure track. But if you're a translational or clinical person, many medical schools have extended that to be longer uh, for, for, those re for these reasons because the research time take, just takes much longer. Okay? So that's sort of my story and, and what, what, what I do. I see patients currently one, day, one half day to one day a week. I do a couple months of the consult service and I'm in the lab the rest of the time uh, spend, and doing lots of committee work and things that can wait till later in your careers um, and, um, and write a lot of grants. Another thing that's really important in, the, in your fellowship program is to, is to not only learn how to think and hy do hypothesis testing research, but also learning how to write. That's something that sometimes gets lost in the effort to do work. So I would encourage you uh, to, to talk to your mentors about writing a grant. Even if it doesn't get funded, it doesn't matter. It's just sitting down and learning how to structure a grant. And learning, just like learning how to structure a paper that Charlie Emerson's going to talk to you about, you got to walk before you can run. And as the time in fellowship is the, only, is, is the time that you're going to have blocked to do it. So it's really crucial, really, really crucial to do it. Um, the story of probably my favorite day of translational research, Daphne knows this story well, uh, was when we were first starting to do our mouse ultrasound in some of our cancer models. Um, I had a very long double type clinic day and I think I finished up around 3 or 4 o'clock, saw 13 or 14 or 15 patients and did a half dozen ultrasounds and biopsies and promptly drove from the clinic over to the vet school where we met and I started doing mouse ultrasounds half an hour after I finished doing human ultrasounds. And that was, that was kind of fun. So, you know, I, I think you've got to have a positive, positive feeling about it and you've got to uh, enjoy the process of what you're doing. I mean, this is a great time in fellowship to learn. It's a great time to learn without a lot of, I know you feel like you've got a lot of demands on your time. I'm not to say, saying that you don't, but you'll have more demands later, whether you're in practice or, or in academics. And so take advantage of the time that you have. Take advantage of being surrounded by mentors uh, and, having, and having opportunities. Okay, so what I want to do is see everyone's at a, coming from a different spot here. So let's try to come up with about four areas or questions you guys might have in the audience. Anyone that you want me to make sure to touch on? I heard a smidge of a voice somewhere. Daphne, you're never shy. That's a key question and that's something we can talk about. I think that's something actually that I've spent a lot of time doing and I think we do pretty well at our place, but I can share what, what we do. Yep. Got it. Okay. So places that don't have quite the research infrastructure. Okay. Anyone else? Got to be something. And selling yourself. Selling yourself enough, but not too much. Right? Yeah. You don't want to sound like a used car salesman by the time you're done writing your grant. Um, anyone else? Yep. Yeah. That's, that's something that'll come back to all of us. In fact, it continually comes back to me now even when I write grants uh, that I ask myself all the time as I get more, the, what I've learned is that the more excited I get about the methods and the research I'm writing, usually the worse it does in the grants because then it gets less focused and, and, and so I think that's an important point too. Okay, so let's start with these four. Let's see how we do on time. Okay, first thing is very important and so this is important not just for the basic scientists. So it's also important for the clinical researchers and clinicians as well. I, I sit on many of these committees 
right now at OSU is building basic and clinical interactions in different areas. So the first thing is that I think that um, we are coming from a little bit of a different language sometimes. So the PhDs need to understand that many of the MDs that they're working with have very limited basic science background. They had it in classes in the first year or two, but how many of the clinical fellows have ever done lab experiments? Take it, have pipetted and other than your classes? So a minority, so some of you have, but the reality is that the majority of your young clinicians haven't done lab work. So things that you're just talking about saying, oh, we'll make this mouse or we'll do this digest or we'll sequence this or we'll do that, these are not, they're not gonna have a context. Okay, so the PhDs have to recognize that. The MDs have a whole different thing too, right? Because we can, you know, I mean, how many of us have spouses who complain bitterly that all we talk about is medicine whenever we're at something, right? So we very quickly go off into this medical conversation that the PhDs may have zero background in, right? So things that seem very obvious to us are a problem. So there's a language problem that, that occurs. Um, and I think that, that these team building things become really important. And I, and I think that you know, the best programs in doing this, what they do is they have multidisciplinary meetings where uh, the meetings will have a clinician presenting a clinical problem and there'll be basic scientists there and they're saying, oh, we might have a way to, to address that. We may have a mouse model that, that we could look at. Or if you get us a cell line, or if we can get a cell line, maybe we can knock this gene out and, and look at it. So the first step is having regular meetings. And I don't mean like, you know, well, I have an idea, let's get together in, in a month and meet for 20 minutes and talk about it. I think the best things to, to do is to have a monthly or, or every other month or twice a month meeting, if you have enough people, to talk about clinical problems with the basic scientists there. And then every once in a while have the basic scientists talk about what they're doing and see if it fits a clinical problem. Usually what you find is that the basic scientists are really looking for clinical relevance for their work because they feel that that helps them get funded and also makes them feel like they're doing something very relevant to human disease. Most of the PhD students go into that because they want to do research that affects human disease. And the clinicians also have a limitation in terms of discovery if they don't extend into the translational because what we learned as basic five years ago is now in clinical practice, right? So we're doing genetic testing of thyroid nodules. You've heard about it, this, that this thing for diagnosis. We have, um, we have oncogene-driven clinical trials. So you're going to do a clinical trial. The question will be, well, do you do it by histology or do, it, do you do it by what oncogene is expressed? Well, how are you going to find out what oncogene is expressed? It's not like ordering a TSH, right? So that's where these types of meetings, I think, are important. And I like the idea personally, what we do in our program is we have them as a regular schedule. Because if they just come up on an as-needed basis, they sometimes don't have the continual involvement of everyone, and it really depends a lot on real involvement, not you know a five-minute or ten-minute conversation. Then you go back and we're all busy, you forget, right? But if it's part of your regular scheduled life, then I think it, it carries a little bit more weight. So, Daphne, I think that that's the most important thing. I think it's not just communication on a superficial level. It's communication that includes regular meetings and presentations because you never really get your feet in, in my opinion, until you have to teach something. You really have to learn it, you have to explain it, and you have to explain it to someone who may not have the same background that you have. So uh, I don't know if anyone has any comments. Stephanie, do you have a comment on that? But I think that's how the most successful programs work. Now, the second part becomes a challenge for that kind of an idea because you may or may not have the critical mass, right? If you don't have a bunch of basic scientists who have any interest in what you're interested in, or a bunch of clinicians have no interest in what a basic science is interested in, that can be a problem. So um, I think the first thing, as I mentioned in the very beginning, within your fellowship program, um, I, I think your fit with your mentor is, is the most, single most important thing. If you have a mentor that you click with, they'll facilitate what you want. Meaning that if you want me to be your mentor and you want to do autoimmune thyroid disease, which I don't do in my lab, and I don't do the science of that, I might call your own Tomer up and say, who just spoke next door that some of you may have heard, and say, okay, 
Talk to Dr. Tomer. He's a good friend. I'll hook you up and let's see what he suggests. And maybe we can do something together. And I've built collaborations with people at other institutions that way. In thyroid, it's a pretty easy thing in the sense that we, it's a very small field and pretty much everyone gets along. So uh, you usually can, you know, I can pick up the phone and call Jim Fagan or Mike Tuttle or something like that. And we've all worked together before. And there's a lot of that that goes on in, in our field. Um, and I think that's true of most fields. I think that's true of most fields. So if you're really interested in something for your career that's outside of the institution that you're in, it can be a little challenging, but it's not impossible. What we see a lot of at OSU are, are people who are interested in something that's not part of the division, for example, that's in a basic science department or, or in a clinical department in rheumatology or something like that. And we specifically allow co-mentorship uh, within our fellowship program. So we require someone to have a mentor within the division, but they can be co-mentored by someone outside the division. And the primary person you work with can also be outside the division, and that's allowable. But some programs are flexible with that, and, and some aren't. But I think it can be a little tricky in a smaller program. Um, and I would encourage you, again, I think be open with your mentor, talk to them, and let them help facilitate for you. But if they're not, then that's when you can go to meetings like this. You meet people, you talk, to, you talk to the fellowship organizers, they can help hook you up if you're interested. And, and I think that, that you'll find that most faculty members are excited about the idea of working with motivated, eager fellows. There's no question about that. Okay? Does that help at all? Stephanie, is that what you're? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, grant writing. This is, I think I mentioned this already, it's really, really important that even if you're not successful with writing a grant, you try to write one if you think you want to do an academic career while you have your mentor there with you, okay? Chances are your mentors have already gone through the process you're going through now. That they've, we've all had to get a first grant. And we've all had to get a grant that's based partly on the idea, but more on you as, because the, the the early starter grants where you might not have that much preliminary data have, have a dual rationale for funding. One is how good is the idea? The second is, is this a candidate that we think is going to be able to run with this and have a long-term academic career ahead of them? Um, and that's judged on the quality of the grant. It's judged on your CV, um, you know, publications and, and um, things like that, and it's judged also a lot on your mentorship and your mentor. Uh, so usually I spend a lot of my life writing letters for either other faculty members or for fellows, for grants, you know, trying to state clearly how much of the idea that that's, I see on paper was their idea, uh, what's their likelihood, uh, how hardworking do they seem to be, and what's the likelihood that this is going to lead to something lead to a person's success that could lead to long-term success. So hopefully you won't have to sell yourself too much in your writing. If it's, I think the ones that work the best are where there's some, some of that, but most of the selling of the young investigator is in the hands also of the mentors who are writing your letters. That, that's part of, as a mentor, that's part of my job, right? You know, what happens as you go through your career is you get to a point now where, you know, it's, it's great to give a talk and it's great to have your name there, uh, but you're also judged as a mentor and part of what's your level of success of your trainees. For those of you who went to some of the thyroid hormone receptor stuff in the beginning where the late John Baxter wasn't able to be here, but one of the slides had this list of all of his prior trainees. He had like 40 people who were faculty members and another 10 or 20 who were who were, you know, so this is a very big deal to your mentors as well, to see you do well. So um, hopefully they're trying to sell you too. And they, it's a lot easier for someone else. It's more comfortable for someone else to sell you than to sell yourself for, for almost all of us. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, and I will tell you this, even at this point in my life, I've been funded now continually for 15 years or, or more. Um, I still have people read my grants, okay? I don't think I've ever submitted a grant that I haven't asked two or three people to take a look at and give me their suggestions. So um, this is something that's hard when you start out because we all get very, we all feel like our stuff is great, right? 
what you've written. You're a great writer. The science is fantastic. It's fantastic. It's great. But you're better off to get a friendly fire, as you call it, you know, to take some friendly fire to get some real constructive criticism from someone who's going to be very critical of, of what you're writing and what you're saying before it gets reviewed. So, I mean, you guys know this. I mean, I, I always have my grants reviewed. In fact, in our, in our Department of Medicine, we've now set up a grant review committee where we're not requiring it, but, but what we're requesting is that all young faculty who don't yet have an independent grant, before it goes in, that we pair them up with two people on this committee who are senior and have, and have had grants for a number of years to read those grants, to give constructive criticism, and then to try to help shepherd them through the process. So I, I think that, that these are the kinds of programs that are important, but if you don't have the program, we're just starting this now, you just have to do it. Um, one of the first time I, was, I saw this was with my mentor, who's a very, very successful, long-term basic scientist, um, who before he even would write a grant, would buy lunch for a couple of friends, call them into a conference room, and he would go to the whiteboard, and he would say, these are the specific games and the experiments I want to do. What do you think? And this is a very senior person who's won many, many awards, and this is what he does, and he still does. He sends me his grants now, which is a nice honor, uh, but, but always. So I would, I would encourage you to do that with your grants, and I would encourage you to do that with your papers. I think it's, it's, it's really, really helpful. And don't get so ego invested that you take it personally. They're only trying to help you. Okay? Um, I just put in a big, big grant in September where we do this, where we actually set up internal and external advisory boards to specifically do this. And I select people who I know are going to be hard because it doesn't help us if they're going to be nice. If they just say everything's perfect, I know it's not. You know, so I might think it is, but I know it's not. Okay. Does that help everyone a little bit? Now, the last thing is focus. And um, I would say, having been on study sections a long time, uh, that the biggest problem I see with young investigator grants is lack of focus. Um, and it's because, in my opinion, it's because you're excited about your work. My first grant got the overly ambitious, can never be done sort of review and got slammed. Um, and um, that's pretty typical. Um, so the reason is that you're trying to cover all your bases perfectly, right? You don't want to leave any, any shred of any doubt when, when you're writing a grant. And again, this is where that internal review can really, really help. Having someone look at it who says, you know, this can't be done in a three-year grant. This is a five- or eight-year grant. Or it sounds great, but, you know, let's get rid of one of your specific aims. And you go, oh, my God, I can't get rid of that specific aim. And then, and then you look at it later and say, oh, it's pretty good without that specific aim. It's like, it's like when you give a talk. You guys make PowerPoint talks all the time, right? And, and, and you make your talks, and you've got a half an hour to give a talk, and you've got 45 slides by the time you're done. And you say, there's not one slide here that I can't do this without. Everything is necessary. And then you say, well, I've got to cut a couple of slides. I can't get it done. So you start cutting slides, and each one kind of kills you a little bit. You hide them. And, and before you delete them, you hide them, right? And then you go back and you look, and you say, actually, this flows pretty well without those slides. So the focus is, is really, really critical. So, so how do you get yourself to focus? Well, one thing that I've done over the last couple of years, and since it's an evolving, ongoing process for me, is the advantage of that the grant length is shorter now. It used to be a grant you, where you had 25 pages to write a grant. And you could write every detail of everything you wanted in every experiment. Um, and I used to pretty much do three specific aims in all of my grants. And that's also where things got very long and very difficult to finish in a five-year period of time. So I've, most of my grants now I've been doing just with two specific aims instead of three and writing them that way. And then when I'm done, then deciding whether there's enough meat in that grant that, I, that I'm okay or whether I need to add something else in rather than writing the three aims and then cutting back. So the key thing for me when you're writing a grant is figuring out, one, what's your question? What's your overriding question that you're interested in? Let's say you were doing something in pregnancy and hypothyroidism. So is your, is, is, is your question, should women be screened? Well, is that really your question or is your, or is your question, will screening 
improve outcomes of their pregnancies. Okay, so if that's your question, then your primary focus is on looking at pregnancy outcome, right? It's not on whether or not you want to screen. And then that changes your model, right? So then you can say, okay, screening would be one component, and then the, out and then the next thing would be the outcome measure. Um, the same thing goes for a basic science grant, is really try to sit down hard and focus on that first page where you're giving your overall aim, your overall hypothesis, and your specific aims. I spend more time on that page one of a grant than any other part of a grant, by far. I change them. It just drives me a little bit crazy sometimes. But that really is absolutely the single, that, that's the hook. If, you, if you're a grant reviewer and you get someone's aims and it's not clearly hypothesis driven and you can't really tell if the aims that they're saying are answering a question that's important, You've, you've lost that grant because the reviewers, A, either doesn't think it's an important problem, or B, it's not focused enough in a way that it looks like it's going to answer the question you want to ask. Okay? So if you always keep in mind, what, keep your eye on that ball. What's the hypothesis of what you're trying to do and make sure that your aims answer that hypothesis, you'll be fine with focus. If you get caught up in, you know, I'm going to do this aim and then this aim and then this and then this, then that's when things get, get very long. Does that make sense? Uh, and that's where a senior mentor can really very quickly look at it. It's usually pretty obvious if someone has really gone, gone way, way off. Um, the other thing to think about in a grant is that your aims shouldn't, so your second aim, for example, should be interesting and important even if the first aim fails. Okay, I see that mistake a lot also. So why do aim, if you're going to do aim one, and let's say you're testing a hypothesis and let's say you disprove it, right, then why do the aim two, right? So you've got to make sure that they're not, that they can be related but not dependent on each other. That's an important, important thing that, that sometimes you see when, when you're writing a grant. So all of these things are important, but for the, the, for the translational researcher, probably once you get out of your fellowship, the single most important thing that you're going to have to figure out when you start looking at jobs, depending on what you want to do, is how that balance between the clinic and your research will work. Okay? Everything's going to take a little bit longer than you think, um, either in setting up a lab or in getting comfortable clinically or in learning, you know, especially if you're moving, right? which most people do, but not everyone. Um, so. So you, this is something that when you talk to wherever you're going to go and you talk to your mentor and you involve them in the process, hopefully, um, you'll negotiate to give yourself time. Because if you don't have any time to do research, you're going to quickly not be able to do it. Because one thing we all know is that clinical medicine takes over, right? And it, both in terms of how important it, it is because you're seeing patients and they're sick, and then also because if you see patients two days a week, you're still on the phone another two days a week, right? So these, so, so time management becomes extremely, extremely important. So what I've tried to do when I first got started is I tried to really try to block some time, which is very hard to do. Um, and the way I did it was I actually made sure I did not open up the EMR for a certain period of time. I know that sounds kind of blasphemous, but my pager was on, my cell phone was there. We're endocrinologists, we're not, you know, you know neurosurgeons. Uh, and, and people could reach me uh, if, it was a, if it was an emergency. But I would, because otherwise, if you're, if, you're, if you're constantly looking at that, it's hard to actually focus and, and get things done. So trying to block time is important, and, and having time allotted in your schedule is important. And, and oftentimes, for early translational investigators, that can be carved out for at least the first three or four years and then to give you a shot to see how things work. And then ultimately, we're, if you're a clinical person and you're able to get funding and you're balancing it, then, you, then at that point you can decide and negotiate how things are going to go based on your funding. Um, if you're, um, and, if, and if you decide that a clinician educator or a clinical pathway is where I really want to go, that's fine. It doesn't mean you're not academic still. It doesn't mean that, that you're not doing even research. There are lots of people who do a lot of research who are on clinical tracks at institutions. And so it doesn't mean you can't be involved, but that's also where 
you come down again to this PhD, MD collaboration. If you're not, in the end, going to be the person in, with one foot in both, it doesn't mean you can't be still to be doing translational research. That's where the team building, I think, becomes really important. Okay? Any other questions from the group? I think we're okay on time. Anything, Stephanie, from you guys that you want me to cover? Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that what I want to end on is one thing. Um, a lot of uh, the fellows, I'm sure, have been hearing about the funding rates and about this is a difficult career choice now with the funding rates and what they are. My belief is not that. Okay? My belief is that good science gets funded and good research, important research, clinically related things that have to get done to better patient care will get funded and will get done. You just have to persevere a little bit. This isn't one of those things that's, that's for any of us. No one writes their first grant, hits a home run, never, and never ever has to rewrite a grant. This is not, not, not the way it goes in, in, in the, in what, with what you do. But I, I do think that with, with these sorts of things, with focus and mentorship, um, and your proactive role in, in the process, things will get funded. Because I think that the NIH and, and other funding agencies recognize that now with the human genome and, and with you know, the era of genetics that we're currently in, we're going to have so much information on everyone that we're not going to know what to do. And we're going to make mistakes if we don't, if we don't figure it out. So, so I think it's an exciting time to be able to merge clinical and, and laboratory-based medicine. Um, I wouldn't be down about it. I would actually be encouraged about it because I think that the cost of all these things are dropping. Uh, we're getting things more as standard clinical testing now that used to all have to be put onto research. So things are getting paid for clinically that never were paid for before. Um, and you have opportunities. And even ever more so now, the basic scientists are reaching out more and more to the clinicians uh, as well as the clinicians reaching more and more toward the basic science. So I think that to me, the future is good, but the future is team science in the end. And I think that's, that, that's where things are, are headed. So, so I hope that helps. And I think Charlie is here to hopefully tell you how to get published. Um, I will say one thing about publication, much like grants, if you don't submit a paper or if you don't submit a grant, you have no chance of getting a paper accepted or funded. So you do need to think about these discrete units uh, and recognize that they're, I think, the, um, the currency of the field as we go forward. So Charlie, uh, with that segue, I get to turn it over to you. Any questions from anyone that we have a minute or two? There's a, just going on the ground, Sam. Sure. Yeah. Anything else you recommend? Yeah, so, so the question is, what about tips in terms of grant writing? Um, and I think, yes, there are some, there's your mentor, but there are some generalized uh, opportunities for tips in grant writing. Um, NIH has that. There are programs you can go to with people who are experienced grant writers who can go through grant, grant writing things. Some of those are webinars now as well, so you don't actually have to fly to them. You can, you can do them. On, on your computer. Um, so yeah, and I think that, that um, so th those are available. The other things, if you're in a place that has um, uh, things like a CTSA grant, a clinical trial center, uh, they usually have uh, people who can teach grant writing and will sit down and go over your grant writing. Um, as well, if there are any non-English primary speakers, also this becomes very important as well. Uh, to have people go over it to teach you the structure uh, of grants. The other thing is for someone who's first writing a first grant, it's important to get examples of a grant that's been successful so that you can have a way to, as a basis, just the way you learn how to be a doctor, right? You watch different people, you picked up different styles, and you decided what you're comfortable with. Grant writing is no different, okay? So Scientific writing is a little bit of a different beast. You know, trying to keep things tight is sometimes a challenge. It's not, you're not writing, you know, prose. You're writing a scientific grant. And so, you know, these things all, all take a little bit of time. But yeah, those resources are, are available. Um, I still think the, the, the most significant primary resource should be your mentor to work with. 
but certainly there are there are other opportunities and and the different all the different funding organizations if you go on will explain how their systems work how the review system works and things like that okay anything else great and I think Charlie you are next So if I'm too far away, let me know. Um, so this is really the, the first slide of what I've sort of talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the time, uh, don't, don't, you know, the decision is to, you're going to do it. After that, you do a little bit and you build this up. Um, and I already talked about why, what's it good for, and, and I, I really think that it is important that people who practice medicine have some experience be a part, at least, of writing a paper because you would, the, you know, these very simple questions actually, when you actually try and commit this to paper, it's, it, it becomes, you think of all the caveats. And, uh, you know, uh, we talked about this. I want to just say a word about, about types of papers. Um, editorials and commentary, you're, if you're starting out, you're not going to be asked to write an editorial or commentary. Uh, but actually, if you are in the sort of the, towards the end of your, your, uh, your uh, endocrine fellowship or towards the end of your uh, uh, PhD, uh, or maybe early postdoc, you might be asked to uh, by you know your mentor to write a uh, to be part of a commentary. Um, articles, I gloss over that. That's really something you're not going to do. This is the way I classify it. By the way, this is the system I use for thyroid. An article is maybe where you write out uh, you know the structure of healthcare in metro. In, in Cleveland or something like that. It's just a, a recitation of facts. Original studies, that's really the one that is probably the, what journals exist for as opposed to magazines. My lay friends ask me if I'm edit, what magazine do I edit? And I, I can't tell you how often I've gotten that question. And, uh, you know, I try and explain the difference. But that's the, diff that's the main difference. And then reviews, yes, you, you could be doing a review, and that's not a bad way to start out, is, is to write a review on something, because then it gets you into the field. Uh, there, is a, there is a big difference between writing a review and doing a study. Case reports, uh, just to let you know now, most journals now, this is a real problem for, for them because case reports tend to detract from the journal's impact factor. The impact factor is based on how uh, many times that paper gets cited. And it actually, it's, there's a problem with the impact factor which I didn't realize. Thyroid, for example, its current impact factor is based on the articles published in 2010 throughout the world's literature, how often they quote papers in thyroid that were published in 2008, 2009. And the reason that's a problem is not for thyroid, it's just a problem for the science, is if you've written a really good paper, it may take a while for people to recognize that it's a good paper. It may be ahead of its time. And so, uh, you know, the really classic papers it's not like uh, a salesman that's, that's sold a life insurance policy and now continues to get a little flow of income throughout. When she, in an impact factor, uh, some of the good papers don't, you know, if you, you've published them a while ago, they don't, they don't help. So it's very current. Um, what, what letters to the editor, we are actually uh, trying to get some case report types published as letters to the editor. Um, and that, because we think, we're not sure, but we think that will, uh, uh, will not detract from our impact factor. So 
to say to say a little more about it if a journal publishes a paper and it's never cited in the literature in the next two years it negatively impacts it makes the impact factor go down uh, and that's, so that's why but the question is do they count those letters to the editor uh, as a case work do they do they use it to calculate the impact factor and we think that they may not count it against the journal uh, they may not count it against the journal uh, but they may count it for the journal so if if if, the, if you've written a letter say to the editor and it's about a very interesting case and it doesn't get cited in the next two years by any, anybody in the literature it doesn't hurt the impact factor but if it does get cited it actually helps the impact factor you know so this this is a, this is a problem because a lot of times when you're in a fellowship that's that's where you sometimes start out writing I would still encourage you to think about writing a case report but uh, think about it more as we're now reporting the fifth uh, case of this in the literature that's less interesting at least to, to us than it is if your case has some unusual twist to it and the main thing is uh, does it have a message for people in practice you know or 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 does it have a message for people in research you know uh, because I have a hard time deciding are we going to just be a repository for the, you know, the 16th case of this association? Okay. Um, so I already said the, the original study is really why journals are journals. And this is, uh, okay, let me back up. The, sometimes the order may not be exactly what you want. But the, what, is the, what makes an original study an original study? Ideally, original studies will test a hypothesis. So the best original studies have a hypothesis, and the goal of the study is to test the hypothesis. And uh, now, I would have to say that 80% of the papers that we get in thyroid and probably in other other uh, journals too is they don't state the hypothesis they state the objective and sometimes they state the objective in very vague terms and so if you can't state a hypothesis then you got to you want to have an objective and it wants to be it needs to be very specific uh, it, it needs to it can't be vague you know it can't be the role of thyroid hormone in wellness or something like that you know it has to be as as it has to the, the, the basic thing is that if you turn that objective into a hypothesis it has to be a testable thing the, the, the study has to address that um, now before I uh, talk more about that I'm going to go to some nuts and bolts which is you know what does what do we get when we get a paper uh, and and we use manuscript central which is used by a lot of journals it's an online service which we use for reviewing papers so the the, the author submit this to the uh, submit the their files to the uh, to this site and uh, then we get a hold of them and we can assign reviewers so authors are using the site review editors are using the site reviewers are using the site um, but in general what we're looking for is a text file of, of the study and then we're looking for image files of if you have figures if you have pathology data if you have cell you know cells or whatever okay so uh, in terms of what you you set you submit as a as a text file uh, we actually ask for word but if you use something like a rich text format I think that can be edited by a number of different things so what's now what a lot of people 
waste a lot of time when they submit a file and they try and make it really fancy. They try and do the formatting, you know, uh, and that actually is very annoying if you get one of those because, you, you know, you end up actually, sometimes I, I will edit parts of it and I, I will, it'll drive me nuts because I don't, you know, I can't work with the, with the formatting. So use very simple formatting. If your paper is accepted, it will be formatted by the, by the journal. And if you have any ideas about how it could be formatted, you can let us know. But uh, usually, I don't even do that. I, in other words, I don't decide what page the figure goes on. That's done by the publisher. Um, and I, for example, I don't even like text justified. Because if it's justified, I can't tell where they, where they uh, you know, sometimes they, they have made misspellings and things like that. So I simply want uh, a text that is not justified, double space so I can read it, uh, and has a paragraph indent, say five, uh, a, fi a tab indent. It's very easy to reverse rather than, you know, you'll see these journals where, they, uh, where they, they've indented two spaces or something like that, and they've done it at the beginning and it, it's, uh, it, it makes it difficult. So very simple. The other thing which I don't have on this slide, and you know, this, this talk has been modified, so I've given it a few years. Um, you want to also number the lines on there and number continuously. So there's a, there's a thing where you can, on the left, you can put down uh, the line number. That helps the reviewer uh, do the critiques, and we're actually going to add that to our instructions. Uh, we had an editorial board yesterday, meeting yesterday, and you know that was one of the things that we decided we needed to actually, you know, get after authors to do, and it makes the reviewer, uh, you know, it's life simpler. Um, you don't want to submit. I mean, we've got occasionally PDF files. Well, you know, who has editing capabilities for PDFs? Most people don't. The editor doesn't. If they want to make a suggestion, if the editor wants to make a suggestion for editing or you know adding lines or putting embedding comments, they can't do it. So, um, and this is in the instructions, but you'd be surprised at how many people don't read the instructions. They just they submit the journal. They spend a lot of time on their cover letter, which I have to be honest with you, I hardly read it. Um, I, I, you know, because they argue, they kind of make the argument about why this is a great study and why we did it this way and why we did it that way. And, you know, I'm not paying attention to that. I want to see it in the paper. And I can tell you the reviewer wants to see it in the paper. Uh, they want to put down why it's important. Well, if it's in, why it's important, that's where you can put in your discussion or, or whatever. So, um, but do, read, do try and read the instructions. Uh, because most of the instructions are there for a reason. It actually helps. Uh, that's the other thing. If your paper is accepted, you, uh, it's going to hold up production if you have to come back now and get all these, the problems with the reference format, etc. Uh, images, you've got to make sure you use high quality images. And this goes back to the design of your study. If you're taking pictures of things and now those pictures aren't saved or you haven't gotten, uh, you know, you've gotten the pictures at a low resolution, this is very important when you have some of your basic papers, you, you have a problem. And, uh, you know, if you have pictures of gels and, and reviewers will say, you know, I can't see that gel, you know, I can't see that, and whatever. So they should be, uh, they should be high resolution. JPEGs are not good because they tend to, do, uh, I, I don't know exactly, some of you may know better than I do, but they, they, can, they can lose data uh, more so. And that information is in the instructions. Uh, color is expensive because you actually have page charges, but you know, that, that's not your worry at this point. Um, so now I'm going through the elements of the, of the paper and starting with the title, uh, ideally not too long, not too short, but 
it needs to provide a message. It, it really needs to state what the paper is about in, in, in as specific terms as possible. And it's good if you can incorporate a message into it. However, be careful about oh, trying to oversell something. I mean, if, if you haven't really documented something, then putting, putting that in the title as though you have, your reviewer is going to come down hard on you. I mean, they're going to say, I was expecting this and I, I didn't get it. So don't, don't go beyond the data in your title. Um, in the letters to the editor, when you go to PubMed, you're not going to see the abstract. So you want the letter to the editor to say what the paper's about. Uh, if it's if it's not that it doesn't say, then uh, then it you know it's less informative. If it says what it's about and people are really interested, they're going to find the article. But if, if it doesn't, they're just going to go you know keep going. They're not they're not going to look at. It. Uh, you shouldn't really abbreviate in titles. Um, I, this is, I have this in, I mean, I, I have a feeling that a lot of people don't talk about this when they talk about publishing a paper, but I think it's important not to be too modest when you, when, when you write your name down. And by that I mean, uh, put, you put your full name, put your full first name, your middle initial, your last name. There are some journals where you cannot tell they, you look at the, the article and they've got the initials and you even look at the print, final print version and they've only got the initials. And the problem with this is you don't get name recognition. And that means that if the, your name isn't recognized, you're less likely for somebody to come up to you at a meeting, let's say, and ask you about that paper because they don't know who you, know, who you are. And, and, you know, it just sort of, it, it creates problems with communication down the line. Uh, there's a lot of names. It, the, the middle initial is important because there's a lot of the same first name, same last name. So it helps. Uh, so I've got the... Uh, I might say this is a problem for, uh, with papers from from Asia because a lot of people have the same quote last name which and I think this is more true in China let's say and maybe Korea but actually their quote last name is their first name because they turn the name around but in the literature it's it's that way so I don't know what you can do about it but like for example I'm trying to get to know all the you know the scientists and, and uh, medical researchers and all in, in Korea and so many of them have last names Kim that you know, I'm starting to get to know them, but it, it takes longer. Uh, put down what country it's coming from. A lot of times people write and, and they, they won't say what country. Um, so the abstract is extremely important because of the internet, it's often the only thing that, that, uh, that uh, people read. I mean, they're going to read that, and they may quote your paper based on the abstract. I mean, they may write a, you know, they may do citations based on that abstract. You can often tell because they'll, they'll in their discussion, they'll discuss another paper, and it's straight, the data is straight out of the abstract. So it's very important that you have a good abstract, uh, as I said. Uh, yeah, and, and I also suggest that maybe you think about writing the abstract last. I mean, that makes logical sense that uh, you want to know what's, what's there and then this is a condensation of what you're writing. Uh, so, in a sense, I think actually these are the components and I think I actually, uh, because of my suggestion to write it last, I think I, this slide appears later on. So, I will, go, I will come to the abstract later. Uh, the introduction is the first part of the main part of the document and it, in general, I think it should not be overly long. You should not, you know, people when they read the introduction, they want to get to the point of the paper. Uh, so uh, it should not have a lot of stuff about, you know, things that people know, uh, I mean, some very basic terms or basic concepts that 
you know, or in many papers, and I'll, that some people w will do that. Uh, so you save your detailed review uh, of prior studies for the discussion. And uh, I've already talked about you need to state the, the goal of the study in st specific terms and the hypothesis. Um, okay, so the methods, obvi obviously every component is important, but the methods are really, that's where you, you have your study design. And if it's, you know, it can be a prospective study, it can be a retrospective study, but this is what, you know, tells the reader how good your study is. You know, what is, what is it, it's resting on the methods. So you need to, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, methods, you need to define terms precisely. In other words, uh, and I think this is, you know, if, if you uh, use uh, a term which might be broad autoimmune thyroid disease. Some people might use it only for Hashimoto's, and, and, but they, they use that. Uh, define groups precisely, state inclusion and exclusion criteria precisely in detail. Uh, so yes, you know, the, the reader needs to know what are your inclusion criteria, what are your exclusion criteria. And this, can, this is, as you know, applicable for a retrospective study. If you, if you studied, uh, you went back and did a chart review or whatever, you want to know what your inclusion criteria, how many people got thrown out because they did not meet those criteria, et cetera. Uh, indicate the study's perspective. Uh, here's another thing. So I, I like to see group names that are descriptive because I think when you read the results, you, uh, you can follow them a little better. So I try not to, I try to have papers, let's say, that instead of saying group one through four, uh, you have groups that are, for example, subclinical thyroid toxicosis. Uh, well, I would put down, I might abbreviate that for SC, capital S, capital C, hyphen, T-O-X. You know, then people reading the result, they can, they can see it right away. But if they have to read the result and say, uh, oh, which, which group was that? And it's, it's, you know, it takes time. Uh, also try and, but try and use uh, abbreviations from the literature. I mean, I'm getting a lot of minutiae here. but. PTC, papillary thyroid cancer, it's used, you know, and every once in a while you'll see authors submit some other variation which nobody other, you know, nobody uses, so. Um, you need a good sis section on statistics and you need the criteria for testing the hypothesis. So what is, you know, and I, I won't get into null hypothesis and things like that, but you need, what's the criteria? Uh, you need to give information on study oversight and informed consent. Institutional, and yet this is one of the things that really you need to think about very early. If you're going to do a study, nowadays almost everything needs institutional review. I mean, if, you, if it's a chart review, whatever it is, that you need to think about it very early when, you, when you're, you know, doing this. So, um, Now, your figure legends should be um, really, uh, there are a few journals that use the figure legends to, to say the methods. Uh, we, you know, you, in general that, those methods should be in the uh, article. There are, but there are some that, when, you know, some of the basic sciences, they'll, they'll give you a lot of detail of the methods right in the figure legends. Uh, it is good to do that for some a complicated study. You can actually repeat it. Uh, you can you can submit some information as supplementary data, the primers, et cetera, et cetera, and that more and more that's being done as a matter. And that's often just online. In fact, as you know, journals are going to online a lot. Uh, state results specifically. So it's important that. When you have a table, in fact, they'll flag that. If you put a table in there, but there's nowhere in the text that you have 
referred to the table, you know, to, you need to say table three shows this, and you 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 don't need to you need to, you don't need to say everything that's in that table, but you need to highlight the the material in the in the table, and that not only highlights it but also tells the reader how you interpreted it. You know, for example, the serum creatinine was higher in the hypothyroid group than, you know, because some people will look at that table and they're not sure whether, what, what, inform, what conclusions the author has drawn from the information in the table. Uh, the same goes for uh, references. Uh, you know, make sure your reference citations uh, that, that you talk about them in the text. We get, occasionally we get a paper where somebody's put a, put a, uh, a reference in there and you go back and, and you don't know why the reference is there. And sometimes people put the reference in twice. That's the other problem. Usually you cite it in order of when it appears in the text. Uh, this is very, to me, this is very important. Uh, you will see journals where, they're, where they will write the results and they will also try and interpret the data. And they um, basically, uh, I think it's very important to stick to the results. This is what we observe. Your interpretation of the results can be given uh, later on. Now there's a term called showed. So people will write, we showed this, we showed that uh, you know, that this is the cause of it. I like to avoid that. I like to, uh, I like a statement that's, you know, our data is consistent with this or what, whatever. But what, the other reason, does anybody come up with a uh, theory as to why, why I wouldn't like we showed? You know what, th th is this clear what I'm talking about? Uh, they'll write down, I'm sorry? Yeah, I think you're you're on the right. I mean, they are in the track that I'm thinking of, which is basically, it to me it imputes a, a bias. It's like our goal in doing this study is to show something, and you know your goal is to you know your goal is actually I think it's to disprove the null hypothesis or something like that. But but to, to you you you're not going to be biased. So, and I think it does get into the thinking of it. Uh, yeah, I actually have it here. <laughs> uh, images, n good quality, I already talked about that. Uh, tables, you know, basically I just point out that tables are great, figures are great to show uh, to audiences, but tables show you the data, so you have to, you know, I think it's, if, if you think it's important that the reader be a, have access to the data, uh, it's, it, you ought to have a table. However, one way to do it is you can, you can have a figure and then you can put the data in, supp in a supplementary uh, part. Uh, the discussion, you want to summarize the results. Usually that's the way you start out. Then you, pr then you provide perhaps an in how you interpret these results. Now this, this could be a little different. You could, uh, how, you know, you might go to, um, you might go to, rather, you might first summarize the results and then you might say how these results agree or disagree with what's in the literature. And then you go to your interpretation of the results and how it supports or does not support the hypothesis. And, uh, you know, and then you want to get a little more sort of generalized. Well, how does this, how does this, uh, go, you know, support concepts in the literature, and you want to discuss the limitations of the study, uh, but importantly, the novel results of the study. Because if you've got nothing novel, nothing new, it's not going to be, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be as high a priority. Although, if it's an important question, uh, then, you know, and you can argue that more data was needed, and now we're providing more data. Uh, also, there is a bias in the literature, as you know, to, to publish, to not to publish negative studies. We're studying, and uh, that's considered maybe not the best thing scientifically. 
But um, then if, if it's a clinical study, you can, you can say these are, based on this study, this is what we think might be a recommendation. If it's a basic study, you might, uh, or, and you can talk about what further research is needed. Uh, if it's basic, you can talk about, you know, what further research is needed. By the way, if you simply say further research is needed, but you have no idea what the research is, uh, that, that's, that can turn off a reviewer. I mean, I've, I've had papers where there was kind of the obligatory further this is needed with, without any kind of a, a thought as to what further is really needed, but what needs to be done, you know. Um, Okay, so uh, the references. Uh, these are just some things to watch out for. When you get a revision back, if you get a review and they ask for a revision and they ask to include something, sometimes if you're not using the right software, you will, uh, if you're doing it manually, you will add these re references and everything gets out of sequence. So just, just watch out for that. Uh, you want to acknowledge grant support. You want to acknowledge help provided by colleagues. You want to disclose ties, potential conflicts of interest. Uh, and you want to, uh, you know, obviously uh, ask, indicate NIH support. Um, okay, so let's go back to the abstract for a moment. So now you've, you know, you've written your paper. The way we do it in thyroid is uh, we have, uh, I've already sort of covered these points, uh, but let me just say the first, I already talked about the fact that this may be the only thing read. The, the statements in the abstract that refer to the reader to uh, content in the paper. So statements that say we, we reviewed this or we, we, sh uh, we covered this, we we report results for serum rhubarb, you know, in, in uh, zebras, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We don't, that is, you try and avoid that. You actually try and give the serum rhubarb, rhubarb the highlighted data, you want to give it. So ideally, in fact, somebody has read your abstract and they're, they're almost convinced about that, that you've, you've laid a solid foundation. So give as much data as possible but if it's a lot, if it's, you know, if it's just a mass of data, write it out in sentences still. I mean, you know, we've gotten occasional papers where they literally, the whole thing is just, just nothing but data without, you know, no, it's not in, in sentences. Uh, and, you know, you can't include everything. But, but think about every sentence you write. It's like every sentence you write, uh, if it doesn't give you really any information, you've wasted the space because uh, you got about 350 words. Uh, so the reader should not only be able to judge the main elements of the paper, the findings of the paper, but also the quality of the paper. Um, and, and the, uh, so talk a little more about what we, what we do in thyroid. We have a background section, methods, results, and conclusions. Background section, we ask for one or two sentences which lay the background. But what they do is they really introduce the hypothesis or the objective. So that having read that, those background sentences, when the reader reads the uh, hypothesis or the objective, they understand the importance and novelty and reason for the study. Uh, and then, of course, I talked again about, uh, you know, the importance of, of really stating your hypothesis in a tight way. Uh, if you ever attempt to write the role of this or the role of that, I'm not saying don't ever use it, but think about what you're really saying when you're saying that. I mean, roles can be all kind of roles. So, uh, okay, we talked about, you know, again, the method section, the more if it's critical, I mean, if your exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria are critical, it's important to put that in the method section. And what's the source of your, you know, of, of if it's patients, what's the source of them, et cetera. 
Um, numbers of patients. Um, if it's if it's if you're if it's a methodology, I mean, you know, this comes up with. Uh, you know, DNA, uh, you know, did you use real-time PCR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if there are several ways to measure, say, gene expression or whatever, be specific about that because uh, this is where people will say, you know, well, they did the study, but they used, they used something that's not, not precise enough. Uh, the results... Talked about numerical data, statistical comparisons. Uh, try and read the, uh, you know, imagine what people would like if it's not there. Uh, again, um, I like not to provide much in the way of conclusions. The conclusion section highlights the most important results, indicates what the uh, author's interpretation of them is, and uh, can suggest recommendations. So. Uh, this is where you you can really make some some fairly broad statements. Uh, Koi, uh, when you write this, you want to avoid look at your sentences. Are you using uh, you know consensus of opinion? That's sort of a classic uh, example of where of run redundancy where you 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 don't need to say consensus of opinion because all you need to say is consensus. There are, you know, numerous examples of this. But what, often, what we often see is that people that have a redundant in their sentences, or writers, shall we say, when they're redundant, they actually uh, have a lot of information that's not, that's not present. So it's like there's extra words there that are not needed, and then the really critical information is missing. Uh, so within sentences, within sections, you don't want to repeat. You know, what often happens is sometimes a person, they'll be writing something up and they'll, they'll turn out, they, they write it, you know, two different days or whatever, and now they've written the same thing twice in the discussion section. Uh, we, there are ways to get around this, which we'll talk about. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people, I have seen reviewers say, well, th you're, you've stated the objective or the hypothesis in the abstract and also in the end of your introduction. That doesn't bother me. I mean, I, because I think if it's one, you know, there's, there's not two things you're doing in the study, so I'm not too concerned about that. You might try and vary the wording a little bit, but, uh, you know, you, you, you do need in the, even if you've stated the objective, or the hypothesis in the abstract. You need to restate it in the introduction. Um, we talked about this. Yeah, this is important that you, uh, for, I just had a paper we accepted, but there was a paper was about leptin, and it was about fasting studies, and in the, in the results, it was written up that after 24 hour fast, or 24-hour uh, low diet or whatever, there was, you know, this happened to leptin or this happened to whatever. And then later on, it's, they used the word starvation. So that, I had to go back and ask the author, are you doing two different studies here? What do you mean? It turned out they were both 24 hours. So why, you know, watch for where you've used two different things for what you're trying to say. Uh, Autoimmune thyroid, a lot of papers you'll see autoimmune thyroid disease and then they're talking about thyroid autoimmunity. Well, the reason that's important is because people define autoimmune thyroid disease either narrowly or broadly. And you may, uh, they may be using uh, the terms in different ways. So, you know, the reader doesn't know that. So, if you, you know, you want to define the term, you know, this is what you're considering but then only continue to use it. Uh, and you want to, particularly when you get to your discussion and also your introduction, you want to avoid circular logic. Uh, this, this is often a problem uh, with some papers. Uh, you do want to do spell checks. Watch for inappropriate autocorrections, where they've actually autocorrected a word and, and put it, the wrong word in there. 
Uh, watch for word, spelling words with the same pronunciation, different spellings and meanings. Okay, this is really where I think some of the things we talked about, this can help you because once you've got your paper more or less done or whatever it is, then you really want to think about two types of people reviewing this paper before you submit it. You want an expert in the field to do it. Now, that could be your mentor. Probably is, you know, going to be your mentor. But um, let's say, you know, you're at a stage where you no longer have a mentor or whatever. By the way, your mentor stays with you the rest of your life. You may not realize that. When I did my fellowship, I thought, well, okay, I'm going on to this university and I'm, my mentor's here. And, you know, well, nowadays we see each other every year. And so, you know, that doesn't go away. Uh, but um, so you want an expert to review your paper, but you also want somebody who is not an expert because they're the ones that are going to pick up the things that, that, that I talked about before where the paper is not it's just not comprehensible. The experts tend to gloss over that. They, they fill in the lines. You know, visually, we apparently, when we look around, we actually add images. Uh, our brain does that, and that's what they do. So it's really, tr if you can try and get somebody who's a good uh, proofreader or somebody, and it can be actually a family member, whatever, sometimes. Uh, but review, if it's not intelligent, you know, they should be able to grasp the outlines of it. Uh, it's a, it's a, you are offered the option of suggesting readers, or reviewers, I'm sorry, when you submit it. Uh, and you, there's no problem with you doing that, but don't pick somebody because they are famous, okay? Because the, review, the editor already knows about the famous people. Uh, you know, we get, we get sometimes people will, will, you know, the president of the ATA, the last, you know, and those persons, actually those people often are so busy it's hard to get them, get them as reviewers. It may not be their field, uh, so that's that problem. If you pick somebody as a reviewer just on the basis of name recognition, uh, it's also going to tell the the, the editor that you are you're less knowledgeable in the field. If you suggest good reviewers that are experts in that field, then it tells you, tells the editor that you are interested in getting a real good review. And uh, so, um, uh, and also I would particularly suggest that if it's an area that uh, maybe the editor is not going to be that familiar with. So, you know, we get papers on anesthesia. I mean, we get papers on thyroid anesthesia, you know, for, for thyroidectomy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's t we have nobody on the board that's an anesthesiologist. So if you're going to submit a paper on some of these areas, and in the basic areas are so broad, it's always, it's always good to, to do that. Now, uh, also, if you think somebody's your enemy, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and it turns out that actually uh, people are, most people are pretty fair and sometimes people who you, who you think might give you a favorable review, they might not necessarily do it and somebody else that you think might give you, uh, uh, might not give you, they might actually give you a more favorable review. So I'm, I'm just saying, don't don't necessarily. I mean, I every once in a while we'll get a paper where five people are are non-preferred, 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 non-preferred. Well, that, that tells me I, I don't know what to think about this. Uh, you know, plus if they if everybody that's an expert is non-preferred, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I mean, I've got to get a good review. So uh, now, okay, so. Um, when you get the review back, this is always a very troubling time, unless it's, because it's never, it's hardly ever going to be perfect, you know. You have to really uh, take a deep breath and sort of 
you know, try and relax a little bit, particularly if you know that it's from somebody who, you know, you actually thought was going to give you a good review. It could be, I mean, I would submit papers to the guy that, that I trained with. And I, it was always difficult when I got that, that paper back to separate what were, you know, sort of non-biased comments from thinking about, well, this guy really thinks I'm not very good, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you just have to try and relax a little bit. And um, you want to you you revise your paper. You don't want to wait too long to revise your paper, but, but you don't want to immediately stop write, start writing. I mean, particularly if you, you think you're writing the final draft. You, you want to try and take a little time to digest this because, and, and sometimes the problem is the way you've written the study is just not clear, you know. So uh, don't, you know, get, get, revise it fairly soon, but take a little time to do that. I mean, and take, because I, that's the other thing is you'll get a paper back and some, you know, it's back in 24 hours. And uh, it, it, sometimes they haven't really, you know, really answered, you know, done a good job. And I just, I mean, it's, it's a waste for everybody. So um, if you get a clear rejection, usually it's really better to submit to another journal because, review, you know, journals just don't have the time. You may have a point. Your, your manuscript may have been, uh, may be, uh, you know, pretty good and maybe it should have been published, but you know, when you get, we get about 550 papers a year, and every one of them goes through me. Uh, and, you know, somebody writes back, you know, that this, well, the reviewer made a mistake. Keep in mind, by the way, that the comments for authors are only part of what is the, the decision is based on, uh, because there's confidential comments, uh, and sometimes reviewers should put the important stuff down for the authors to read, but they don't always do that. The other reason for rejection may be that the editor already knows we got a paper on this field coming, you know, coming out, and we don't, we know, we we need to have something different. So uh, it's usually a waste of time. Uh, I, I submitted a paper, you know, I mean, I've certainly had papers rejected, and you know, my so. When you submit your revision, it's important to thank the people who did, who reviewed the first vision, version, because they are doing this for nothing, basically. They're taking their time, and nowadays that's even a greater sacrifice because we're in, in an economy where everything's a cost center, including yourself. And so uh, you want to you want to thank them. Uh, the cover letter should indicate the changes made. So if there's a critical point, you know, don't just in your, in, your, in your response to a point, don't just say, don't try and answer the question uh, and then leave the, the, leave the editor hanging as to whether or not you made any changes in the paper. You want to indicate, we'd, you know, not only that, uh, that you know, what, what, what your response is, but what changes you made in the paper in response, because you know you're now looking through this paper to see, well, did 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 they really make any ch you know changes? Um, uh, the other thing is avoid too many attachments. If they have a place to put the cover letter, put it there. Don't put it as an attachment because that's just one extra step that the editor has to do, uh, and not all editors will print out the paper when they get it back, they'll just look at it. So now they gotta print they gotta do they gotta look somewhere else for for the file. So um, so actually um, I think the area, you know, I I hope uh, if anybody has any questions, but um, I really think the problem which I couldn't really give you any definite definite guidance on or whatever is, you know, how do you get started? And, uh, but anyway, any questions or whatever, comments or
problems that, you know, you may be in the process right now of submitting a paper. Some of you may have already submitted a paper to thyroid. So any questions that you have, now's, now's your chance to be an anonymous questionnaire. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, do you not then run a risk of, say, uh, citing a reference from the 80s and then you yeah. might be too old? I think that's a good point. I think that's it because actually I'm being a little idealistic. But, uh, but uh, you know, you can say so and so showed back in, you know, 1990 this. And this is not, there has been very little work since then. You know, that kind of thing. I just, what I hate to see sometimes, I mean, we, we will get, sometimes we'll get a, a, a reference used and the paper, you look at the paper, and it actually doesn't have, doesn't really give the information that the statement says. And the, uh, the uh, reviewer just wanted to have what looked like a current, res, you know, current reference. So. Uh, it, it's not a hard and fast rule, but and if you think that it's going to be a problem, you could indicate why you're doing. It. You know, this has been known, whatever. So. No, well, it's not insulting their intelligence; it's taking advantage of their time. Uh, first of all, I'd say the cover letter is uh, probably that's. I don't say it's a waste of time, but the key thing is to have. The, the have the ideally you have the actual you printed the actual comment of the reviewer that's the ideal and put a little space there and even put a little font I mean this is one thing everybody does it but um, you, you can't actually do it and, and but put a space between between what the reviewer said and your response so this, so that your response is clear in fact you could even put response or something like that. And then below your response, put a double space to the next comment. So, uh, and then as far as uh, this is, so your, the second part of your question was referred to what? Now you just say that we have, we have, that uh, we have now added information about the age mean age and range of patients, uh, you know, and you don't have to say indicate where it is. I mean, you know, we're going to be we're going to trust, you know. But but if you don't say it, or you may you may say, uh, I, I don't I th can't think of a good example. But uh, some people say, well, we don't think this is re really relevant, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a long kind of answer. And after it's all done. You don't know whether they agreed or, you know, if you're going to, if you don't think this need, is, you, you just say why. And so we, we don't, you know, but, but if you, if you, you know, you need to, the person needs to know whether you've done it. You don't have to say where it is in the paper. If it's key, you might say it's in the, we have now added this information in the discussion or something like that. But uh, it should be right there in the, in that area that they give you. For doing that. Okay, well, anybody that has any other questions or any comments, you're welcome to. Uh, you know, I'll stay a few more minutes. So, thanks a lot.